Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from, um, and welcome to the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network's first webinar. Uh, I'm Ross Wise, I sit on the Board of Directors for the CGCN. Um, I'm a senior winemaker with Andrew Pella Limited, based in the Okanagan Valley, but also worked nine vintages in Niagara prior to moving west. Um, part of my role at the CGCN is being the chair of our Knowledge and Technology Transfer Committee, or KTT Committee. Um, the role of this committee is to find ways of passing on the great knowledge being unearthed by our researchers and getting it to the Canadian wine industry. So that's what's led us to this point. The first in what will be a series of CGCN virus and plant material focused webinars. So for our first one, our Grapevine Red Blotch Virus theme webinar today, we're very pleased to welcome Sud Pujari, Senior Research Scientist at Brock University's Cool Climate and Enology Viticulture Institute. Uh, Patricia Bowen, Research Scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Summerland, BC, and Mark Fuchs, Grapevine Virologist at Cornell University's School of Integrative Plant Science, Plant Pathology, and Plant Microbiology. So before I pass it off to Darian to get the webinar rolling, I'll just go over a couple of guidelines for the session. Please keep yourself muted uh, for the entirety of the webinar. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end after everyone's presented their material. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the chat box by clicking the chat button at the bottom of the screen uh, and make sure you mention who the question is addressed to and then Darren will moderate these questions at the end of the session. Uh, the session will be recorded and it'll be posted on the CGCN website within a week's time. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Darren, who's going to give a brief presentation about the scope of the CGCN. Uh, take it away, Darren. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm just gonna share my screen here and I am going to present a brief overview of CGCN. Uh, I'm project manager and I've been with CGCN for about a year now. So let's see here. Make sure you can see that first before I start. All right, you should be able to see that now. So I'm gonna be giving you a brief overview of CGCN and our mandate, including research in clean plant protocol. So CGCN was incorporated in February of 2017 and comprised of membership from the four grape growing associations in Canada. These being the BC Grape and Wine Council, Grape Growers of Ontario, Council de Vin de Quebec, and the Grape Growers Association of Nova Scotia. Each member has elected one to two board members the board member, the board, sorry, is comprised of Hans Buchler from BC, who is elected chair, Bill Schenk from Ontario, who is elected vice chair, Robert Prang from Nova Scotia, elected secretary, Matthias Openlander from Ontario, elected as treasurer, and then we have Ross Wise from BC and Louis Thomas from Quebec, who are also on the board. We've also recently assigned two co-directors. Melanie Gore is the co-director for Quebec, and William Armstrong is the co-director for Nova Scotia. The CGCM Board of Directors has maintained a mandate that is twofold. So firstly, to advance the Canadian grape and wine industry by ensuring a sustainable domestic supply of certified propagative grapevine material, including both rootstock and cyanwood. The viruses of particular concern for the industry at this time were red blotch and leaf roll, which result in significant economic losses if left unaddressed in a vineyard. Please note that there are at least two different types of leaf roll viruses of concern, grapevine leaf roll associated virus one and three. We are also testing for grapevine Pinot Gris virus. And secondly, CGCN is also the lead for the Canadian Grape and Wine Science Cluster. So the application for the AgriScience Cluster was submitted in January, 2018. The cluster activities were built on past research in each province to create a national coordinated effort to address key challenges in the sector. Approved in May 2018 for 8.4 million in federal funding through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Canadian Agricultural Partnership and 3 million in industry funding for over five years to 23 research activities. There are now two more years remaining in this program. Agriculture Minister uh, Lawrence McCauley announced the funding in July of 2018. The cluster activities were built on past research in each province to create a national coordinated effort to address key challenges in the sector, including strategic management of grapevine virus diseases, research into cold hardiness, and sustainable management of soil, water, and crop quality to improve quality of Canadian wines. The key to all of this is the knowledge and technology transfer back to the industry. 
I'll be going into detail about each of CGCN's 23 research activities in a future webinar, so make sure you're looking out on our social media and our website for that. Today, we're just going to be focused on introducing CGCN as a whole to the industry or those who may not know about us yet. Although I'm not going to go into detail about it today, if you would like to read about our research updates from the, from the cluster, these are posted as they become available on the CGCN website under the research heading. Most recently, a couple newsletters on crop protection, a number of cold hardiness updates have been posted for BC and Nova Scotia. We also have a post with plain language summaries of each of the projects once per year in the spring. The past years can be found under cluster and research updates. CGCN also has a Facebook and Twitter page dedicated to posting research findings, relevant news links, and other industry resources. You can find our uh, handles at the bottom of the screen there. CGCN also shares other relevant research updates not funded by the cluster under the resources heading right there. These include updates and recommendations on biosecurity and virus scouting. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, and both domestically and internationally. So now I'm going to shift gears a bit and talk about CGCN's clean plant network. In June of 2019, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti, on behalf of Agriculture and Agri-Food, uh, Minister Marie-Claude Bebeau announced more than $2.3 million in funding through the CAP program AgriAssurance to create a network of certified virus-free grapevines that Canadian grape growers can plant in their vineyards to ensure the long-term viability of the Canadian grape and wine sectors. The funding is allocated to our interim certification program and our certification program, which I'll, I will go into depth about now. So the CGCN has two clean plant protocols that run in parallel for the time being. The interim certification program is a program that works with nurseries to test existing propagation blocks for leaf roll one, three, red blotch, and pinot gris virus at a 50-50 cost share. The testing for the interim program has started in August 2019, with collection of vines and testing being done by the Covey Virus Testing Lab at Brock University. We are working with both nurseries for general propagation, as well as wineries and growers who wish to do custom propagation of their own vineyards for this program. I will go into detail about custom propagation on my next couple slides. The certification program was launched to propagate from CGCN's G1 repository, currently tested and held clean at the CFIA Center for Plant Health in BC. With the help of nurseries through G1A, G2, G3, and G4 levels for grapevines material that is tested and certified from a whole host of viruses. The interim certification protocols would test existing nursery propagation blocks. The first phase of testing will involve a random sample of 10% of the vineyard, including a visual inspection and PCR testing. All sampling is done by Covey Virus Lab and tracked via GPS. If 15% or more of the vineyard is found to be infected, it'll be dropped from the program. If less than 15% infection is found in the vineyard, the propagation block will move to the second phase. The second phase of the protocols involves testing each individual vine via a composite sample of either five vines, leaves, or two canes. The threshold of virus is 0.1%, so one in 1,000 vines. If the composite sample is found to be more than 0.1% infected, the nursery will either have the option to test all five vines individually um, and, remove the infect and only remove the infected vines or remove all five vines from the composite sample. Once the vineyard is tested and confirmed clean under the 0.1% infection threshold, the plants are propagated from those vines and can be sold with the phrase propagated material tested and found free of grapevine leaf roll associated virus one, free, a blotch, and pinot gris virus. Although like all other certification programs, no warranty will be given on the final plant. Yearly audits through a 10% random sample, as well as visual inspection of the vineyard, as well as nursery records will occur to will occur to ensure that there has been no reinfection of the propagation block. Look for this badge at your favorite Canadian nursery to see if they are participating in our interim protocols. Currently, we have North Shore Grapevine Nursery, Viticulture A&M, and Canadian Fruit Tree Nursery Cooperative. All of these nurseries have the results back and tested clean. Please refer to our website to see what they have available. As testing is completed, our results are be being posted there. CGCN has also opened up the interim protocols 
to Canadian grape growers and our wineries who would be interested in partnering with a nursery for custom propagation of grapevines from their own vineyard. The cost of testing is subsidized to the grower or winery by 50%. As the winter months are upon us, testing would be done on cane samples. Please visit the CGCN website for more details or note the contact information at the end of my presentation. And as of mid-September 2019, the long-term certification program was launched. We currently have approximately 50 clones, including rootstock, stored clean in the city center for plant health in Saanich, BC. These vines have went through testing, so heat therapy and or tissue culture for a whole range of viruses, not just the four that we test in our interim program. Once all tests come back negative, their varietals are deemed clean and put in the repository. In CGCN's long-term standard, these vines will be propagated through four levels known as G generation one to generation four, where CGCN will be able to trace the phytosanitary status of each vine. G1 is the mother block of clean stock currently in Sydney. G1A, G2, and G3 are multiplication blocks to bulk up material, which are currently accepting applications from interested nurseries to apply. And G4 is the grower's vineyard where clean plant material will be planted and used for wine grape production. We currently have two nurseries participating in this program at the G1A level, this being Agriforest Biotechnologies located in Kelowna, BC, and Upper Canada Growers located in Harrow, Ontario. Our certification standards are also currently going under a review of an amendment to allow certification of already existing vineyard blocks through the use of high throughput sequencing technology. When this amendment is finalized, CGCM will administer a full public rollout, post on our websites and our newsletters, as well as mention it in our next webinar. We also encourage growers or wineries to contact us if they wish to see certain varietals available through the program, as we are consistently monitoring the industry to see what is wanted to ensure our repository is fulfilling those wants and needs. You can either submit your wishlist varietals through our contact page on our website, or you can email my contact on the next slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this slide up here for a little bit while I introduce Sud. And if anyone has any questions, please send me an email. And that concludes my presentation on CGCN. So now to present Sud. So Dr. Sud Pujari is a research scientist at Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. He also holds adjunct professor status in the Department of Biological Sciences at Brock University. Sud leads the National Virus Testing Facility for Grapevines at Covey, and his research is focused on advanced molecular diagnostics and epidemiology of grapevine virus diseases. Along with leading Covey's grapevine virus testing facilities, Sud is also CGCN's lead scientist our clean plant program. I now pass it off to Sud to present on the symptoms of red blotch, local research on the distribution and spread of red blotch, the importance of clean plants, and the role of CGCN. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, and I, pass it off to Sud. Okay, uh, just uh, trying to share my screen here. Uh, is it looking good, Daria? It looks like you have uh, your notes on our screen. You just have to make sure you've got the presentation there. Oh. Uh, Can you see now? We can still see the presentation, yes. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Darian, for the introduction. Um, let me move some of these things. I think I need to move some, some things here. Okay, you can see now. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, before I start, you know, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for, the, um, for the initiation for this webinar series, the CGCM. Um, this is the outline of my presentation for today. Um, before um, uh, the first uh, first thing, I will start with a brief introduction to the economic importance of the red blotch virus, and um, and then how uh, the symptoms might uh, help to uh, suspect uh, red blotch virus in different wine grape cultivars. And then I will explain um, what where we are at in terms of red blotch uh, disease incidence uh, in in Canada, and also research on the insect vectors uh, for the red blotch virus. Um, and do, I do have a couple of slides on different uh, testing methods and uh, 
also how and when and what to sample when you are looking for uh, to test the grave points for the red blood virus. Uh, and I will be finishing with the, um, in, you know, a couple of slides on the importance of clean plan programs. So the first the economic importance, uh, as you might know, the leaf roll and red blood. Sorry, said to interrupt. We can't see your second slide. Oh. Sorry to interrupt. No. So if you if you get your full presentation, uh, try to to put your full presentation. There is a button at the top that it says display display settings. If you if you click that one and say show presenter, duplicate yeah, show presenter view, the one at the top. Yeah, I believe that will work. Oh, okay, I know what you mean. Can you because see you have a double screen? I believe. Slide? So click that. Yeah, I did. Can you see the second slide now? No. We cannot see it on a, on a presentation mode. We, we, are, we, we see the first slide and then the one coming after. Um, let me end the slide show and uh, start to do that whole process again. I don't know, you can disconnect your second screen and, and just use one uh, screen in your laptop that will probably uh, work. There we go. Can you see anything now? Yes. Now it's perfect. good. Yeah. Sorry for the glitch. Um, uh, can you see the third slide on the economic importance? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for That's the glitch. Okay. Uh, as I'll start this again. Uh, as you might know, gray point red leaf roll and red blotch uh, diseases are the most economical, economically important diseases in gray points, uh, at least in North America. Uh, I'm not going to read, uh, read uh, all the numbers here. Uh, these are the studies that uh, mostly came from the United States, um, both on leaf roll and red blotch. Uh, but the bottom line here is uh, uh, we started uh, to recognize the fact that the growers, winemakers, industry is noticing the significant uh, negative effects of uh, red blotch virus in uh, um, both red and white uh, viniferas as well as hybrid grape, uh, grape cultivars. Although we don't have such economic studies in, under the cool climate conditions, but I guess uh, the, our next speaker, Dr. Pat Bowen, is, uh, is going to talk uh, on the negative impacts of red blotch virus under the cool climate conditions. Uh, now the symptoms, um, as uh, we are in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, uh, just to give a, a comparative uh, uh, idea, uh, we are hearing more about uh, COVID-19, uh, about the various symptoms it can exhibit in different people with different immunity levels or age groups or, or even um, differences in expression in climatic conditions where the people are. Um, when you compare that to the plants, although plants do not have such a strong immune system, uh, but the symptom expression always depends on a lot of variables, such as the, the grape cultivars that, uh, that is being infected, the virus and the virus strain, uh, the climatic conditions, of course, and also other uh, biotic as well as abiotic factors. As you see in this uh, white vinifera uh, Chardonnay, uh, you can see the chlorosis, necrosis um, on the edges here. Um, so that's the typical symptoms. Usually we start to see these symptoms at the end of the, the, the grape growing season, especially uh, when it starts to um, uh, turn the fruit color, that is version. Um, same with the red fruit cultivars, Cap Frontier. Um, mostly what you see with the initially uh, purple or red blotches, uh, which starts um, and then um, slowly it covers the entire leaf. And these are the very typical symptoms. But that being said, uh, even in hybrids, we started to notice uh, symptoms due to the red blotch. And these are the leaves that actually we tested for the different viruses and we found only red blotch. Um, so we, we do have a little bit of confidence that at least on these hybrids, uh, this is the very typical symptom of uh, red blotch uh, virus. 
But that being said, um, it, is it is highly unlikely to differentiate. Uh, it is becoming un unlikely to differentiate uh, between, uh, especially with the leaf roll and red blotch. Uh, for example, this uh, leaves here that you're, uh, you're seeing, it's only tested for leaf roll three. You see very typical symptoms of uh, red blotch in the second leaf here. Whereas this leaf shows the typical leaf roll like symptoms. Again, sometimes it can be easily confused uh, with the, the symptoms or the expression due to mineral deficiencies, such as this leaves here. As you can see, the pattern of yellowing or reddening uh, is along the edges, which is very typical of uh, magnesium deficiency. That, that brings us to the next topic uh, the red blotch incidence in Canada. So this is the web page um, of the European uh, and Mediterranean uh, Plant Protection Organization global database, where it shows the presence of red blood virus in different provinces. As you can see, you can notice three different provinces, BC, North Scotia, and Ontario, but we do have evidence that uh, the virus is present in Quebec as well. So um, going to the details of the three um, uh, survey studies that we have uh, we have been doing in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Rupose, uh, Tom Lowry, uh, as well as uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, uh, Deb Moreau. Uh, these are the uh, results. Uh, the Venn diagram shows here the relative incidence of grapevine red blotch virus along with the leaf roll three here, um, uh, which is um, indicated in blue, the red blotch virus, uh, in three different provinces. The numbers here represents the five wine composite samples uh, collected randomly without any preference to the symptoms. As you can see, the presence of grapevine red blotch virus is relatively higher in Ontario vineyards. Um, and more details uh, on the sampling strategy, um, the testing methods you can find in these referred papers. So uh, we've been doing uh, large scale sur surveys in Ontario as well. Uh, as a part of a, a CAP pro project that uh, Darian is referring uh, earlier. Um, in Ontario, Wendy is leading the project. Uh, uh, of course, this project is funded by OGWRA collectively by, uh, from CGCN as well as AFC. Uh, when we are looking, uh, well, last three years we've been doing the surveys, but this year in 20, last year in 2020, uh, we changed our uh, strategy and look more into the younger uh, uh, vineyard blocks, uh, which I mean to say younger is one to three uh, years of age, um, hoping to know um, how much infected material is being planted. Uh, the sampling strategy here is a little different. Uh, we have part five, we have surveyed part five vineyard blocks, a uh, total of seven, 874 samples. The sample size is 20 composite samples. Uh, uh, in a block. When I say uh, composite sample, each represents uh, 20 individual wines. So as you can see, 34% uh, uh, has been tested positive, which means that um, at least um, in those 34% of the blocks, either one uh, or 20 of those composite samples are present. Even in those uh, uh, one composite sample, we have to be careful in what we are interpreting here. Uh, it may be just one wine or as many as 20. So the graph on the right side here uh, represents uh, on the x-axis, you can see the age of the plant and uh, um, the y-axis is the percent positivity. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see in 2019, um, it is almost 60% of these composite samples tested positive for red blood. The fact that we found these wines even in the wines that are planted in 2020, uh, shows that you know the need for sourcing virus-free planting material, and how important for us to involve in certification programs. So the next question is, um, does virus uh, does red blood spread? Uh, I know there have been a lot of research going on uh, in the, in the states as well as here in in Canada. Uh, so these experiments we started a couple of years ago, and this is our second year. Um, so we are using sentinel wines. At least first, first thing, what we what we wanted to know whether it is spreading or not. So uh, for that, we use the sentinel wines, uh, which uh, means we selected, we tested the wines before in 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 pots that are grown in pots, 
uh, both rootstock and sand material are both tested and we place them uh, in a couple of selected vineyards where we know the red blotch is present and one of those vineyards have been um, a regular um, commercial vineyard and the other one being the, um, the organic that means there is no insecticide but spray. So that's our uh, experimental strategy. Once we placed the wines uh, throughout the season, at the end of the season, we took them out, make sure all the leaves were uh, removed and sprayed with the insecticides, change the pot, pots and uh, the potting uh, mix, as, and then we transferred into a, a safe uh, you know, greenhouse conditions. And we are testing every three months to see on the new growth that is coming from these sentinel wines to see if there is any virus that is uh, being uh, infected. So these are the results. Um, the vineyard one uh, out of 20 wines, we didn't find any positives. Uh, that uh, being the traditional vineyard and uh, we don't find much of the insect uh, populations there. Uh, but in the second vineyard, uh, we did find uh, nine positives out of 18 after, uh, this is the results after 12 months post regrowth. Uh, and the second vineyard that we did, uh, the second vineyard we repeated in 2020, this is the uh, latest results, three months post regrowth, uh, did find one positive out of 20. So these are still uh, preliminary results that shows the, uh, you know, red blotch can spread in the vineyards uh, and the research on the potential vectors are still in progress. So what we are doing next, um, that's uh, my student, Ming Liu, uh, here uh, taking the samples from Sentinel Wines. Uh, he's uh, more looking at the, uh, the molecular epidemiology of this red blotch virus. Uh, looking both the sentinel wines, the, the mother wines in the vineyards, as well as the cover crops, wild species, perennials. He use, he's using the most sensitive method to detect and characterize the virus that is sequencing. And hopefully uh, by the end of, end of this term, uh, he will have a good results. And more on the ongoing research, um, um, we have a, a PhD students, Rabani Saha, uh, with uh, Justin Denkham at the AFC Wineland. Uh, she's been involved in uh, monitoring um, insect populations in seven different locations in Niagara, um, different sampling methods. Um, and she's been uh, also doing the transmission assays um, um, with, with the COVID, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult, but uh, she's trying her best. Um, what else we know about the, the red blotch virus? Uh, we did some studies in collaboration with uh, AFC Summerland, uh, as well as the same experiments repeated here, uh, using the buffalo tree hopper, which is a close relative to alfalfa tree hopper. Uh, I'm sure Mark will be talking more about that. Um, we do know that the buffalo tree hopper is a carrier of the red blood virus, which means the virus is present um, in, inside the uh, body of the buffalo tree hopper in the commercial vineyards. Uh, so far, the studies that we've done here and my understanding with Tom Lowry in BC, uh, there is no presence of alpha-alpha tree hopper in any of our surveys. Um, similar reports were reported from Washington State. Um, although uh, we, we also did to, uh, try to find out where the virus concentration is more uh, in, in the body of the infected buffalo tree hopper, I would say, uh, it is in the gut, uh, which again tells us that, you know, um, the virus, uh, it is definitely a carrier for the virus, but the tra it, it is a completely different uh, thing that when, when we say carrier and the vector, uh, vector means we have to, uh, again, perform more studies, evaluate both in the greenhouse as well as the commercial natural conditions uh, to confirm its vectoring capacity. So uh, more on the buffalo tree harbor, this is how it looks. Probably you can see that with naked eye in the in the vineyards if we have one. Um, uh, when you compare to the leaf hoppers, it's, it's comparatively bigger in size, six to eight millimeters, um, and uh, it's not a, a, a regular pest. It's an occasional pest on the grapevines. Uh, more on the, the the symptoms of uh, feeding feeding damage. I'm sorry, feeding damage of the buffalo tree hoppers. As you can see on the shoots when it feeds, it kind of forms a, as a griddle. Um, which kind of becomes necrotic, and then you can see these dark circles around. And that's probably the signs that you, you might see if you have a leaf or um, buffalo or sorry, tree hopper infestation. The same um, um, pattern you can see on the clusters as well. This is the new um, observations that my student found this year. 
and you can also go for the cluster set. You can see um, um, the grid link here and here. So uh, switching gears a little bit here uh, on the testing methods, uh, I, I spoke about the symptoms uh, and biological indexing also plays in the same, uh, same symptom-based uh, um, identification method. Uh, when, when it comes to serological, um, I do know that the, at least uh, so far, we don't have any uh, antibody or serological test available for red blots, but they do for uh, other grapevine viruses. Uh, in terms of molecular testing, uh, the standard being the uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uh, as well as we have quantitative PCRs, as well as the digital droplet PCRs, as well as the highly sensitive next generation sequence or high throughput sequencing methods. So a lot of people ask me what is the best um, preferred sampling time and what is the best tissue type for uh, virus detection. So I put on this graphic for you. Uh, as you can see, uh, different months uh, with the green color, probably the best. Uh, um, Best time to collect the samples uh, is a leaf sample anywhere from starting uh, from the variation uh, to um, uh, when the uh, when the dormancy occurs, the leaf uh, goes out. If you want to go for a canes, you can start anywhere from November to January. I just put the um, February, March, and April in in uh, gray shade just because uh, mostly that time the, the pruning happened. We don't have enough material to collect the uh, samples for virus testing. Um, so the tissue type, um, definitely the mature leaves at the bottom of the canopy, um, covering both sides, um, both directions, uh, just to make sure that um, you know these viruses are unevenly distributed. We want to cover the ground. Uh, so four leaves uh, put together in a one bag, and uh, that will do the job for virus testing. But important thing is we need to collect the leaf with intact petiole because the petiole is the one with a lot of flowing tissue. That's the one that we are going to use. When it comes to the canes, um, lignified canes are perfect for virus testing uh, for red blotch. Um, two canes, we prefer two canes per wine, eight to six, eight to 10 inch long. Um, at least depends on size thickness. Um, so um, I would like to just end with this uh, um, uh, slide. Um, um, we talked, uh, uh, thanks Darian for introducing the CGCN. Um, I know we are relatively young industry here in Canada, but the importance of starting clean and staying clean uh, will pay much dividends to our sustainability of the, the industry. Um, as Darian mentioned before, they do have uh, two certification programs, internal verification and long-term certification program. I urge all the growers uh, to, when you are sourcing the wines, uh, please ask the questions, whether it is tested, whether it is certified. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the, the, the funding agencies, as well as uh, the collaborators, uh, research technicians, and my students, and there are more educational resources here. And if you have any questions, my contact information email uh, is right there. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact, contact me. And with that, uh, thanks again, everybody. And I would like to uh, pass on to Darian to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Sud. I will now like to present Pat. Oh, let's make sure you can hear me first. Yeah, you should be able to. Okay, so now I'll present Pat Bowen. Pat is a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Summerland, BC, where she leads a program in wine grape physiology and ecology with a focus on developing sustainable practices to produce superior quality grapes and wines. Using drone imaging, sensor networks, and GIS tools, she also develops precision management techniques to improve vineyard health and performance. The viticulture GIS she created has served to characterize local terroirs and define subappellations for BC. Now we welcome Pat to present on the influence of red blotch on grapevines in BC, red blotch influence on grape and wine composition, and sensory impacts of red blotch virus. Can everyone hear me? Hello, everybody. Um, Pat Bowen from uh, Summerland, British Columbia. I'm going to be covering red blotch disease impacts on vineyard performance, namely red blotch disease uh, impacts on grapevine physiology, fruit and wine quality, and bud hardiness in Cabernet Franc. 
This was a study conducted over a couple of years by the whole wine grape research team at Summerland Research Center, including myself, Carl Bogdanoff, Jose Urbez Torres, Sud Pujari, who was there at the time, and we miss him, Kevin Usher and Tom Lowry, each of us adding our own expertise uh, to the project. Um, so we were interested in practical impacts of red blotch disease on red wine grapes, things that producers are interested in. So impacts on vine growth and vigor, leaf canopy function or photosynthesis, sugar production, fruit yield, maturation and quality, wine sensory quality, and cold hardiness. Now this work uh, has already been published in the American Journal of Enology and Viticulture, and we'll give you some contact information later that you can request a reprint if you wanna learn about more details of this work. Okay, so we were really fortunate to find a great site for this experiment. So, uh, Jose Urbez Torres and Sid Pujari were surveying the Okanagan Valley for viruses and they found this vineyard block that had, it's a Cabernet block in a commercial vineyard where there was a number of infected vines with red blotch and they're shown here with these red dots. So we decided to do the study to compare healthy vines and red blotch infected vines on performance. So it was conducted in the two years, 2017 and 18, very typical years in terms of climate, um, upper 1500s for growing degree days, the harvests were um, very typical timing, October 24th and October 10th for Cab Franc in the area. So what we did was set up 18 replicate blocks based on single vine experimental units. So we had for each of the 18 blocks, one infected vine or diseased vine and a clean vine. Um, actually there were two clean vines, so we had a spare in case one of them um, became infected during the study. And this infection was confirmed each year with PCR. So that work was done by Jose and Soot. Okay, so one of the first things we looked at was impacts on sugar production in the vine of the disease. So in this data I'm showing, we're comparing normal looking leaves. Here's a red blotch vine here. These green leaves that look totally normal, they're green versus a healthy vine and their um, comparable leaves. Okay, and here we have photosynthesis plotted over the growing season. And you can see in July, even though these leaves look healthy, this green are the healthy vines and the red are the red blotch, we're seeing a, a decrease in effect on photosynthesis. And post foraison when we normally see lower photosynthetic rates, we're still seeing this impact on photosynthesis, even though these leaves look totally normal. So pre-symptom showing, you're seeing this reduction and it averaged about 24% reduction in photosynthesis. Okay, so the next um, comparison we made was just looking at red blotch vines and, and looking at the photosynthesis by these normal looking leaves versus symptomatic leaves. Okay, so here again, we have photosynthesis plotted uh, again, over the growing season and this green here are these normal looking leaves versus symptomatic leaves, these two symbols here. And here we can see this big reduction again. So these le normal leaves are already not producing enough sugar or normal sugar. And then we're seeing a further reduction as they become symptomatic. After Verazon, we're again, reduction in photosynthesis. But now we had a look at um, leaf area, lamina area that was looked normal green versus uh, the red areas and we can see this green tissue is still uh, uh, poor in terms of photosynthesis and the red area is really bad. So overall we find a 50% reduction in photosynthesis when symptoms start to show. So you can see this huge negative impact of this disease on sugar production in the vines. Okay, so it's not surprising to see these impacts on yield and yield components. What I've shown here is these two sets of bars. The first is 2017 and the second is 2018. So for yield, we're seeing this big impact on yield per vine, averaging over the two years, 42% uh, crop production. I think that's a good thing because the fruit is kind of terrible. So you don't want so much of it. 
Uh, for clusters per vine, we, again, we see an impact in both years, 21% reduction on average. But here's where we see this really interesting big impact is on fruit set, berries per cluster in both years. Okay, so the, the clusters have very few berries and the berries are large. Some of this is compensation effect. Um, it could also be an effect of having more seeds per berry, did find more seeds per berry and that stimulates berry growth. Okay, so just so you know what this looks like, <clears throat> the top picture is the healthy vines in that vineyard. These are Cabernet Franc clusters and below that are the red blotch a disease cluster showing that they're very loose, few berries, very big berries. Um, it impacts on vine vigor and crop load, uh, pruning mass. It's not surprising these vines uh, didn't grow as well because they are not photosynthesis, their photosynthesis levels are much lower. And then the crop load levels were also lower in both years. Going to uh, fruit quality now, basic juice composition. Uh, we found, not surprisingly, a reduction in soluble solids or bricks over the two years, averaging four degrees bricks lower in soluble solids. So this can be actually used as an indicator that a vine might be affected. If you take uh, the brick sample and it's, it's much lower than, than clean vines, you might use that to uh, indicate that you've got a diseased vine. Titratable acidity was higher in both years by 2.2 grams per liter and the pH was also increased. For berry phenolics, the biggest effect was on anthocyanins. We found this huge reduction in anthocyanins in the fruit in both years. So the, these phenolics are expressed on a fresh mass basis. So this would be the concentration in the tank, 37% lower in um, the red pigment in, in the berries. For tannins, we didn't really find too much of an impact. For skin tannins, we found a reduction one year, but not the next. Seed tannins, we found no effect the first year and then a little bit of reduction. And then finally in the second year, and then finally um, total tannins, you know, even though this is significant, there wasn't really a big impact. So for the phenolics, it's the anthocyanins. Okay, so for winemaking, we wanted to see the impacts of of red blotch disease on the, the sensory quality of the wines. But instead of just making red blotch uh, in, uh, diseased uh, uh, wines versus uh, normal or clean wines, so we would have here um, in this list of our treatments, we have the 0% red blotch and 100%. We decided to make a set of wines that included uh, small portions of red blotch fruit added to the clean fruit to imitate what you might find in a vineyard like this one, where you have a few vines in here and you harvest the whole thing and it's, it's in a sense contaminating the, the crush. So to do this, because our, our original blocks only had one vine and we didn't have, wouldn't have enough fruit to make the wine, we created some new blocks. Um, this is an infrared, uh, a plot of the block showing areas of high and low stress because of the uh, canopy temperature. So we set up these new blocks so we would have enough vines per block to bake all five uh, wines treatments. Okay, so each wine is replicated four times. Uh, pretty uh, standard winemaking techniques were used. Uh, 1.4 liters of wine in, in micro lots in these uh, coffee presses. They work really well for making red wine. Uh, standard wine making the yeast D254 yeast and CH16 ML uh, malolactic bacteria. And after pressing them off and letting them sit for a couple of or so months, um, they were each tasted blindly and rated by 10 expert tasters. And when I say expert tasters, they were all trained as judges and they were all commercial winemakers from the Okanagan Valley. Okay, so this is a normal uh, discriminant function analysis plot um, showing the factors that explain most of the variability among the wines. So you can see the legend here showing the different wines here with a um, the healthy fruit is zero here and that's the dark purple and this light green is the red blotch wines. And you can see that most of the variability among the treatments is um, due to factor one. 
And factor one on the on one extreme on the right hand side is a black fruit flavor and aroma, uh, long aftertaste, body, lots of color, um, all the things we really love about Cabernet Franc wines. That's on this side. On the other end, the other extreme, we have poor color, um, lacking in those traits I said earlier, and also vegetal flavor and aroma. Okay, so you can see how different these red blotch wines are than these wines made mostly from clean fruit. Now I'm just gonna circle the ones that have the most red blotch fruit in them, because we did find a trend along this factor for these characteristics. So the more you add, the, the worse the wine becomes. And at 20% kind of looks like the threshold where you start to really degrade the wines. So this was for 2017. And in 2018, we almost found the identical result. Okay, so the same, all of the 20 wines plotted here. And I'm just gonna circle the 20%. And this time we started to really detect some veginess in these 20% wines. So it looks, I mean, we'd have to do a lot more work to really define a threshold, but when you're getting to that much uh, fruit in your vineyard, you're starting to degrade your, your wines when you're, um, if you're including that fruit in the harvest. Okay, something that Jose Urbez Torres noticed when he visited the vineyard site uh, in the fall, and here you can see some vines with flag tape on them, is that all the red blotch disease vines had their leaves still on, they retained their leaves, either it was delayed or they were just not gonna fall, which is a really interesting result and points to the possibility that red blotch disease is really impacting ABA levels in, in the vine. And we know that abscisic acid is, is necessary and important for normal leaf fall. We also know abscisic acid is important for the production of anthocyanins in the berry, so that maybe explains that effect. And we also know abscisic acid, when you apply it to grapevines in the summer, uh, this was some work Jim Wilworth and and we did uh, some years ago, if you apply AB8, you get better bud hardiness. So with AB, uh, with this possibly lower ABA levels, it might explain our results when we looked at hardiness. So over the two winters, we measured bud hardiness four times, expressed as LT50, which is the low temperature exotherm 50, causing 50% 50 bud mortality. So the lower the temperature, the hardier the buds. Okay, and you can see these LT50s are higher for the red blotch and the four times, two and a half degrees less hardy on average. So it's really impacting hardiness of the vines. Some people think that's a good thing. Maybe they, 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 you're not gonna make so much of this bad fruit and, and they won't survive as well, but um, this is a big impact and maybe points to the involvement of ABA um, in the disease impacts. Okay, so just a quick summary. Red blotch impacts to vineyard performance. Reduced photosynthesis and vine growth. Fewer, looser uh, clusters with larger berries. Reduced yield. Delayed and retarded berry development. Degraded wine sensory quality. Poor color, poor flavor and aroma. Lacking body. Reduced bud hardiness. And as I said, this study is already published and you can um, request a, a reprint from us. And uh, just to finish, I want to acknowledge um, the, the BC Wine Grape Council that funded this study um, when we started and then the CGCN also provided funding toward the end. Um, our technicians at Summerland are amazing. Here's Brad Estegard and Steve Marsh taking photosynthesis measurements. Jose's technicians were also involved in this work. We also have amazing collaboration with the wineries and the vineyards in the valley. We can think about the winemakers that tasted all of those wines for sensory. Also the vineyard that allowed us to do the study. When they first discovered they had red blotch, they wanted to yank all those vines out and I would do the, that, I would do the same thing, but they left them in just so that we could finish the study and we're really grateful for that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pat, for your presentation.
Quickly before I move on to introduce Mark Fuchs, I just want to remind everyone that there is a chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them there. I'll be moderating them at the end of the session. Okay, so you can see Mark's screen. Uh, Mark received his master's and PhD degrees from University, Lu University Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg, France. He joined the Department of Plant Pathology at Cornell University in 2004 with research and extension responsibilities on viruses of fruit and vegetable crops. Mark's program is translational based on discovery oriented research and the transfer of discoveries into practical applications. He is leading multidisciplinary team efforts on major vine virus diseases such as red blotch, leaf roll, and fan leaf. So now we welcome Mark Fuchs here. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me today to talk about red blotch with a particular focus on transmission and management. And I'd like to express my gratitude to Ross, Darian, and the whole team for the opportunity to present um, and I'd like to offer uh, my kudos to the Canadians for all your efforts in establishing a certification program because such program and the production of clean vines that have been extensively tested for uh, the absence of viruses is a cornerstone of sustainable viticulture. So kudos to everyone. So when I was approached um, to contribute to this webinar series, I was asked to provide an international flavor to my presentation. And I'd like uh, to um, just show you the distribution of red blotch virus um, at the global scale. So in addition to Canada and the United States, red blotch virus has been described in vineyards in Mexico, Argentina, India, Korea, and an experimental vineyard in Switzerland. And there is little doubt that this global distribution of red blotch outside of North America is resulting from the exchange of infected propagative material. Mark, so, we're not on your second slide. Oh, oh, still oh. on your first slide. Oh, 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 oh. Let's see, what am I doing? <laughs> Do slideshow. Does it make any difference? No. No. We can we can still see your PowerPoint on the side. Go to play. Yeah, that one. I, let's try again. How about now? Does it make any difference? Jose, he needs help like Sud needed help. <laughs> Hi, Mark. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not IT guy. Do you have a double screen, Mark? No, I don't. Uh, then it shouldn't be a problem to, to put the full presentation. Try to click play from current slide. Are you able to see it yourself? Um, so at, at your end, it doesn't make any difference or does it? I don't see anything, anything different. If you'd like, I can show your presentation on my screen and you That's can just stop sharing fine. yours. That's perfectly fine. Perfect, I'll do that. I apologize for what's happening, which I'm not fully clear. Sorry, one sec. I'm just going to upload your presentation here and then I will share my screen and follow along with you. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for your patience. All right. And here we go. Can you see that screen there? I can. Okay. Go to the next one. There you go. There you go. Thank you so much. You're so what do we know about transmission, at least from a, a United States perspective? 
We know that the red blotch is transmitted under greenhouse conditions by the three coordinate alpha alpha hopper. Uh, we know that this hopper, next slide please, is not a pest of grape, although um, through its feeding, um, it can, previous one, it can create um, some damage. <laughs> um, and the feeding damage as illustrated by Sud previously with another species is um, impacting the flow of nutrients through the vascular tissue and uh, through the girdling uh, resulting from the feeding damage. So um, the three corner alpha hopper is not a pest of grape whatsoever despite the fact that it, it can create some damage on shoots and rachises and so forth. But legumes, overall speaking, are preferred hosts of this hopper. And I acknowledge that this slide is very busy, but you might recommend, recognize vetch, clover, trefoil, bindweed, some peas, um, and some of these legumes are often used in cover crop mixes um, um, in vineyards. Um, next one, please. What we know also about this hopper, it is an occasional pest of legumes in soybean and peanuts, for example, in Southern US regions. Now, when you look at the reproduction of these insects, you know, when a male and a female um, get together, there is oviposition, eggs will develop. And the cycle is completed through the development of five different instart stages until the, 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 uh, the adults develop again. What is interesting in terms of red blood transmission is that once any of these instars, whether a first instar, a second, third, fourth, or fifth instar, have the opportunity to feed on a red blotch infected plant, they might ingest and acquire the virus and keep the virus through the different instar stages until they reach the adult stage. This means that if one of these instars ingests and acquires the virus by feeding on a red blotch infected plant, it can result in the development of an adult that carries the virus. And this adult has never visited a red blotch infected vine. So the virus, in other words, is transmitted through molds of the different instars and adults, and therefore the transmission is referred to as being transtadial. Next one. So what we know also about the transmission is when one of these hoppers is feeding by sucking empty the phloem cells from their sap through the food canal, the virus will move through the food canal into the body of the insect. And it will reach the gut, the foregut, the hindgut, the mind gut, the mid gut, cross all this gut tissue into the hemolymph, which is the equivalent of the blood of the insect, if you want. And sorry if there are entomologists um, tuning in for my poor description. And from the hemolymph, the virus will then move into salivary glands. And these salivary glands are connected to the salivary canal, which then will eject the virus particles upon another feeding event of this hopper. So in other words, the virus will be ingested and acquired about feeding on phloem sap of a red blush infected vine transit through the body of the insect. And if the virus is not found in the salivary gland, this particular hopper will not be able to transmit the virus. In other words, if it's only found in the gut or hemolymph, the hopper, the alpha-alpha hopper, 
will not transmit the virus. The virus has to be present in the salivary glands. Next slide. So just to summarize what we have learned, upon feeding on a red blotch infected plant, the virus can be acquired by the three coronal alpha alpha hopper. The virus circulates with a, within the body of the insect and it just circulates, it does not propagate within the insect. So the transmission mode is characterized as being circulative, non-propagative. The virus though is transmitted from any development stage of the three corn and alpha alpha hopper, nymphs to adults um, through molting, both adult and nymph stages are vectors of red blotch virus. And based on what I said before, if a nymph acquires the virus on an infected plant, it might transmit it to the subsequent development stages and to the adults without having these nymph stages and adults having to feed on an infected plant. This has obviously profound implications in terms of better understanding the epidemiology of the disease and devising the best management strategies. Next slide. What have we learned in terms of spread in a vineyard? Here I was fortunate to uh, partner with um, some vineyard managers in Napa Valley in California over the years. And you see here a Google map of the uh, section of the estate where I highlighted a Merlot to the right of this uh, slide, which uh, is fully infected with red blotch. So there is little doubt that the virus came with the planting material. Now I'm going to call your attention to the cap franc in the middle of the slide where you see close to the repairing area, some aggregated red dots represented aggregated grapevine uh, um, that are infected with red blotch. And throughout the rest of the vineyard, um, the vines are pretty much scattered when infected with red blotch. So the Cap Franc was planted in 2008, two hectares. And in 2012, when I first visited that estate, I noticed this gradient of um, aggregated disease vines close to the repairing area and confirmed the presence of the virus in that area. So then starting in 2014 in the sixth leaf, I was interested in the distribution of the infected vines throughout this two hectare vineyard and see how this distribution of infected vines would evolve over time. Next slide. So just to show you the gradient, um, you can see that um, when I look to the west, to the left of the previous slide, at the edge of the vineyard, I'm standing taking the picture, um, my back facing the repairing area, you can see the gradient of disease vines and suddenly in the middle of the row there, you have uh, vines with a green canopy. In hindsight, what was happening, and you know, first of all, my intuition was that something was emanating from the riparian area, potentially an aerial vector, transmitting the virus, hence the gradient. But this was not the case. What I learned is that uh, the, grade, the, the, the aggregation of disease vines was explained by the planting material in that particular case, it was the rootstock that was infected and the vines were established infected in 2008, but it took four years for the virus to translate, translocate from the rootstock into the scion and for the scion to develop disease symptoms that were very apparent to the vineyard manager. Next slide. So I mapped the disease vines and every little uh, cell here in white is an asymptomatic vine, in red is a symptomatic vine on top. 
and the bottom is a graphical representation of the same vineyard where I mapped it across rows, five line panels across rows. And you can see that basically the bottom graph is uh, illustrating this aggregation to the right that I've seen on top. So close to the repairing area at the edge of the vineyard where the aggregation is occurring, I arbitrarily delineated an area represented by this um, uh, pinkish um, rectangle. And I'd like to keep uh, your attention on that area because I will fast forward from 2019 to 20, to, from, sorry, 2014 to 2019 now. So you can see how the disease progressed in that particular two hectare Cap Franc. And when I started, the incidence of the disease was 4% throughout the whole vineyard, but 32% in the sub portion that are again, arbitrarily delineated at the edge of the vineyard close to repairing area. So here we go, 2014 infected vines in red. The newly infected vines 15 are depicted in green, 16, you can go forward there in, thank you, in blue, 17, next one, in purple, next one, 18, in peach, 19, in yellow. So basically from 14 to 19, we went from four to close to 15% incidence throughout the whole vineyard, and from 30 to 93% incidence in the area close to the edge of the vineyard. Next slide, this represents basically a one to 2% annual increase of newly infected vines throughout the block. But in the sub portion, it was a 12% annual increase in the disease. What we learned by teaming up with quantitative epidemiologists is that um, disease spread was present predominantly within the vineyard. In other words, the vines that were established early on and were infected serve as inoculum source for secondary spread and further movement of the virus into newly infected vines. There was little influx of the virus from outside sources into the vineyard. Most of the disease incidence is explained by within vineyard spread. Next slide. Thank you. So adjacent to the Cap Franc vineyard is a Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard. What is interesting about this vineyard, next slide, is that it was planted in the same year in 2008, so 1.5 hectare Cap Cabernet Sauvignon, and like the Cap Franc, symptoms were observed in one section of the vineyard in the first leaf, one year after planting. And you can see the, the bottom section at the south end of the vineyard for which almost every vine is in red. That particular clone of Cap Sauv was sourced from one nursery. The other Capsoft clone at the north end of that vineyard was sourced from another nursery. So again, here we have an example of where the inoculum in the southern clone of the Capsoft vineyard was source infected, unfortunately. And in that case, because the disease symptoms were apparent in the first year, in first leaf or first year, there is little doubt to me that the scion was the source of the material rather than the rootstock, which was the source of the virus inoculum in the Cabernet Franc. So what is interesting is you remember the annual increase of newly infected plants in the Cap Franc. In the Cap Sauvignon, Looking at disease progress over the same time, 
the annual increase is less than 0.1%. So here we have an interesting situation. We have the cap franc on one side where the inoculum is present at a much lower rate than in the cap soft, because overall speaking, we are having almost half of the caps of vines that are infected versus most of them in the cap franc that are aggregated close to river penny area. So why, if I have so much more inoculum in the cap soft, do I see so little spread? In contrast, I have so little inoculum in the cap franc, but so much more spread. Next slide. So our working hypothesis is it might have to do with the dynamics of the vector population. And actually our um, several year, consecutive years of surveys of insect populations in the two vineyards clearly indicate that the population of the three corn alpha alpha hopper is higher uh, by a factor of tenfold in the cap front close to repairing area than in the cap soft. So this is highly likely explaining the difference in spread between these two adjacent vineyards. Next slide. So what have we learned in terms of spread and transmission in the vineyard? We have learned that the planting material is the major source of the virus inoculum that spread is mainly predominantly occurring within the vineyard. There is influx of the virus from neighboring vineyard blocks that is occurring, but is not the dominant explanation on why some plants get infected over time. The spread dynamics is clearly associated with the three corn alpha alpha hopper population abundance. In that particular vineyard, this insect vector is present in vineyards only during a very narrow window during the growing season. We found repetitively this hopper only in June and July, never before, never after. However, it is present on ground cover plants earlier than in the vines themselves, basically in ground cover in March and April. What I'd like also to share is similar work done in New York never provided any evidence that red blotch is spreading from vine to vine or vineyard parcel to vineyard parcel. And this seems to be the case uh, on many East Coast uh, uh, vineyards. We never found the three corner alpha alpha hopper in disease vineyards. And we never found any insect that would qualify as potential vector of red blotch in any vineyard in New York that has been surveyed. In other words, all the insects that have been caught and analyzed in vineyards where red blotch is documented have not shown any capacity to ingest and acquire the virus. What is also interesting is, you know very well that wild grapes are present around vineyards in North America and wild grapes are readily infected with red blotch in Northern California, but not in New York. I never found a single wild grape in New York that is infected with red blotch. So let's switch to the second part of my talk in terms of management. Red blotch, like any other grapevine virus, unfortunately, does not have any cure in the vineyard. Once a vine is infected with red blotch or any other virus, it will keep the virus until it is removed from the particular vineyard or until it dies. Therefore, it is critical 
to carefully select the planting material and avoid introducing viruses uh, as replants or when new parcels are established. In terms of red blotch, and like for any other virus diseases of grapevine, the management action that I recommend these days based on our understanding of the disease biology and ecology is very simple. Focus all the efforts on the virus inoculum in the vineyard. Don't worry about vectors. Don't worry about the three corner alpha alpha hopper. Worry about the virus inoculum. And how to tackle the virus inoculum? There are two approaches, roguing or removal of disease vineyards. Roguing consists of identifying red blotch infected vines and removing them uh, one by one in an infected vineyard. In teaming up with ag economists years ago, I wanted to model somehow the best approach that would help optimally reduce the negative impact of red blotch. And the optimal approach would be in the case of red blotch, uh, roguing versus removal. And the ag economist came up with a model by which 30% was a theoretical threshold, 30% disease incidence. If the disease incidence is less than 30%, roguing is the optimal management option. If the disease incidence is higher than 30%, the model recommends removal of the entire parcel. Obviously, this 30% threshold should only be considered as a guideline. Um, and this type of guideline should be customized to a parcel, to a vineyard estate, to a region, or to a state level. And this is because there are singularities among the states and regions in terms of management practices of vineyards, tolerance to the effect of red blotch and fruit quality, uh, bad hardiness and so forth, and uh, obviously uh, business models. Next slide. Coming back to some of my introductory comments about certification and the, pro the production of clean vines that are extensively tested and shown to test negative for detrimental viruses. Uh, that's a cornerstone of sustainable viticulture. So I'm glad to hear and to see all the progress that has been made in Canada. So to give you a broader perspective on certification, I would refer to whatever has been done is ongoing as work in progress. So for example, in the USA, there, there is no national program and there will never be a national program. And this is because certification is managed and regulated at the state level. So California might have a certification program, Washington state might have another certification program, and New York might have a third certification program. This being said, there are tremendous harmonization efforts that are ongoing to try to find common ground among these certification programs so that people talk to each other and more importantly, the plant material talks to each other and can move without compromising the safety of the vineyards from one location to the other. I should also say that in, like in Canada, certification is voluntary. In Europe, the situation is different because certification is mandatory. What is interesting in Europe is certification, as we speak about it today in terms of cleanliness of certain viruses, in Europe, 
the sanitary certification is associated with clonal certification. In other words, the vines that are certified have to perform to certain standards in order to meet the criteria of a certification program. Now, one of the anomalies of Europe, and there are many, um, is that the country directives in terms of certification are much, much, much stricter than the European directives. So material coming from North America may make it to the EU, but might not make it, for example, to Germany or into France because the certification standards are much higher. Now in New Zealand and Australia, and again, this shows the variability um, and the diversity of the programs around the world. And each uh, country has different standards. Uh, I learned that uh, you guys are talking about leaf roll one, leaf roll three, red lodge and pinot gris virus. Um, among other viruses that are included in addition to those of concern to Canada, Australia includes grapevine repressive stampeding associated virus in grapevine virus B. South Africa is interesting by itself also because rather than certifying for the absence of viruses, South Africa certifies for the absence of viral diseases. And that can be quite challenging because leaf roll disease uh, has six different viruses associated with it. So it leaves some flexibility as how to really interpret the standards of that certification program. But interestingly, uh, the South African certification program does not focus exclusively on viruses. It includes a number of bacteria and oomycetes as well. And one of the bacteria that is included is the one that causes Crongo, Agrobacterium vitis. And um, next slide. And that's basically my concluding slide. As I mentioned to me, certification is work in progress. There are plenty of challenges, but also many opportunities. And I think it is time like you guys have been doing over the past years and are still doing, it is time to imagine or reimagine what certification is all about. It is time to revisit the health status of foundation vineyards around the globe. It is time to revisit standards of certification programs so that they are meaningful. They take into account the latest information on disease ecology the latest information on the latest advances in diagnostics. And uh, there is little doubt that multidisciplinary efforts are needed to remain strategically vigilant and always look forward. And if a certification uh, program is not meaningful, it doesn't fully meet the expectations of the industry in the clinic, in terms of the cleanliness of the plant material, we have to go back around the table and further the conversation because this um, program is designed to benefit the industry and solely benefit the industry um, and the industry impact on how to shape and reimagine certification is really critical. And the last slide, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to thank uh, you all for your attention and I wish you well um, and the best in the certification program and in your daily lives. And I'd like to thank all the institutions that are supporting my research and extension program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, that concludes all of our presentations for the day. Sorry, I just need to move the spotlight here. There we go.
And now we open the floor to any questions. So we've had quite a few questions come in. I'm just going to go through them. And then whoever is best suited, Pat, Mark, or Sood, whoever is best suited to answer that question, please just type in. Uh, oh, so I see the first one is directed at me. Are root stocks also tested in the short-term protocol? No, they are not currently tested in the short-term protocols, but they should be um, purchased from another certified source. Um, we have a question here. Can either disease be present without visible leaf markers? I assume this is red blotch and leaf roll that they're referring to? Yes. <laughs> uh, particularly early in the season, we're, and Sid could answer this better maybe, but uh, we can have vines that look totally normal that can be in infected. Yeah, as, um, as uh, Mark uh, mentioned in, in the Capfranc, uh, Capsol or Capfranc uh, vineyards in their, in, in their trials, um, if it is infected in the rootstocks, it took four years uh, to show symptoms on the cyan. That also explains, you know, even though there is a little bit of virus present, uh, it takes time to show the visible symptoms. Um, and we saw that uh, in a lot of varieties that asymptomatic nature is also uh, common um, in many varieties, uh, especially uh, I think that that is more suited to hybrid cultivars. Okay, we move on to our next question. Uh, can virus be spread from grapes purchased from other areas and then composted on site? This may have been answered, but. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start and probably Mark can uh, uh, help me. Uh, if it is, a, uh, I really doubt that um, uh, the virus uh, can be transmitted from composting grapes to nearby uh, wines. A um, couple of factors here. Um, we know that the virus is present in the berries, uh, but the virus is only present in the living tissues. Once it is composting, I think the virus titer or virus uh, will get degraded. The second thing is the timing. Um, I think in, in, at least in Ontario conditions, um, maybe California is a little different. Um, by the time we come, we come to the composting, uh, the composting, that means harvest is done, that means the winter is set in. Uh, I don't think there is enough room for these insects. Uh, they, may, they might be already overwintered by the time, uh, or there is no uh, space to feed on them, on the, on the vines also, because they also went for uh, dormancy. So that explains a few things that uh, it is probably highly impossible uh, for that. And, uh, the next thing is, I don't think the virus will survive in the soil, in the compost. So. I fully agree with what saw this swing. Um, and if I may to come back to, to the previous question, uh, just to echo what Pat and Sadat said, uh, the, on the difficulty to diagnose visually a virus infected vine, just because most of the growing season, the vine will remain asymptomatic so visually speaking, we might miss the infection. Um, we might also miss it, although we know that the vineyard of some vines are infected due to environmental conditions. So a vineyard that you might visit in 2018 and you clearly see uh, visual um, signs of virus infection, whether leaf or red blotch, you might go back next year in 2019 to the same vineyard and you won't see any symptoms just because the environmental conditions have changed but the virus is still in the vines. Okay, moving on to our next question. And I do realize that we have about two minutes left in our webinar, but if you are able to, please stick around. We're gonna go through a few more questions. Uh, we won't be going through every single question here in the chat box. So if you do have any that aren't addressed here, um, please contact Mark, Pat, or Sud. So this one is addressed to Pat. Did you retest the healthy vines beside the red blotch infected vines to see if virus moved? Uh, they were retested each year to make sure they were still clean and they never um, got uh, diseased. They never tested positive. Okay. Do environmental stresses like drought or heat 
exasperate the impacts on fruit quality and yield? Um, so some work has been done on this is to try to rehabilitate or um, do what it takes to help disease vines make better fruit because the fruit is so bad. Some of that work done really well down in Washington or Oregon. And it, it, you know, the impacts are so bad. You can move it a little bit, but um, not enough to, to make the fruit uh, well enough to, to make wine from. So my guess is that if you try to stress them to think you're gonna get more color or better quality, like a deficit irrigation, you're probably just making it worse. Um, and it's not worthwhile to try to do things to rehab those vines, just pull them out. Okay, so next one is what causes leaf reddening in infected vines? Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll start. Uh, because uh, the nature of this virus is either leaf roll or red blotch, they are phloem limited. That means they're particularly limited to a particular type of tissue called phloem, which is uh, the tissue that uh, provides the transport of the nutrients uh, from, um, from source to sink. So when these viruses are present and replicating in those particular tissues, I think the plant will go under a physiological uh, changes. That means um, it's, it's a kind of stress that it goes when the virus titer increases at a at certain period of time in a growing season, uh, plant recognizes that kind of stress and initiate um, anthocyanin pathway, uh, just like um, uh, any kind of damage that happens to red fruited cultivars, you see the leaves are turning uh, red. Uh, just like a natural phenomena where you see in the fall when the temperature goes down, all the maple leaves turn uh, red. Uh, this is the same phenomena. Plant, I think the wine thinks that it is going under kind of stress and initiate this anthocyanin pathway, which produces the pigments on the leaves. And that kind of blocks the chlorophyll and the photosynthesis won't happen. And the sugars that needed to be transported from the green leaves uh, to the fruit is disturbed and that's why we see less sugars in the fruit and more sugars in the leaves that red, red uh, with the with the red uh, leaf symptoms looks like that was a good answer nobody else piping in so next one is how quickly after a hopper feeds on an infected plant before it becomes a potential vector and can pass on the virus via subsequent feeding So I, I take a first stab at this one. Um, in our case, in our studies with the three coordinate alpha, alpha hopper, um, it takes about 10 days for the hopper to feed on an infected vine for the virus to be ingested and acquired. And by I mean acquired, a, the virus is present in the salivary glands, that organ that needs the presence of the virus for the hopper to subsequently feed and start a new infection. So it takes 10 days, um, but we are still working on, that's a minimum time because once it is in the salivary glands, it will still need a few more days before the hopper can release the virus and start a new infection. So my short answer is at least 10 days. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll down a bit because we have quite a few questions coming in. Again, if it's not addressed here, please um, either get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with either one of our presenters uh, or I can answer questions in regards to CGCN. Um, so it looks like so far that some of the vines can come from a nursery already with the disease. What are the best secure clean sources in BC? Well, I would want to say CGCN <laughs> would be one of your sources of clean vines and any of our participating nurseries. So if you have questions about that, please contact me. Um, someone said, I believe other research has pointed to Virginia creeper hopper as a possible vector. Is that correct? I'll, I'll take that question. Um, the research, the transmission study that was done with Virginia 
creeper leafhopper is uh, basically using the tissue culture rice plants and, in, and also in in-house conditions. Uh, I think these vectors, uh, these insects behave differently uh, in a controlled conditions when you compare to the natural conditions. Um, that's why we are seeing these huge differences in the, in the natural conditions. And I'm sure it is not the case in, in the natural conditions because if that is the case, we would have been 100% red blotch in all over by this time. So in other words, it, it is not a vector of importance for vineyard managers. I, I would dismiss the Virginia uh, creeper leafhopper as a vector of red blotch. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Fuchs, this one's for you. Would you elaborate on the Hypervid project and how this might be incorporated into diagnostics for not only Red Blotch, but other future viruses? The, I'm sorry, the, the what project? It says here Hypervid, H-Y-P-E-R-V-I-D. Uh, damn, catch cold. Um, maybe? If I'm not mistaken, and correct me, uh, Nadia, if I'm way off, um, it is a project that relies on sensory technology to identify um, red blotch or leaf rot infected vines. Am I correct? If you just could chime in, because just let me know whether a yes or no. So anyhow, let, let me. Let me expand a little bit. Um, That's what she's talking about, Mark. Okay, perfect. So this is a project that was started very recently in collaboration with Fresno State University in California, uh, by which sensory technologies is being deployed to map infected vines in leaf roll or red blotch disease vines, this technology is very powerful, has been shown great promise um, in the lab um, and in some vineyards by which, at least for leaf fall, there is 94% uh, sensitivity uh, with this technology, meaning that the technology is capable of identifying with accuracy at the 94% level red blotch disease vines without having to collect any sample or running a lab-based assay just by flying over a vineyard some cameras with sensors that are calibrated to identify leaf roll disease vines. Um, we are optimizing this type of technology. Uh, we are not invalidating it and we are not claiming that it can be used as a routine diagnostic yet, because there is still a lot to optimize for the same reason as Stad mentioned in his uh, talk, because there are many confounding factors that can interfere with an accurate diagnostics of either leaf roll or red blotch. So there is a lot of optimization going on, but the expectation is down the road to have this technology available for vineyard managers, and particularly those who farm on big acreages to very early on, because this technology has also the potential to identify disease vines at the pre-symptomatic stage. And obviously this would be highly valuable in terms of disease management to quickly assess what is the incidence and to take then appropriate management actions based on the information generated. So sorry if I was very slow because I, I, I was unsure as to what Hypervid was referred to, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna read off one more question here and then we'll wrap up things for the day. Uh, the last one is any, is there any research into clones, so cyan or rootstock or varietals that show immunity to a red blotch or leaf roll? If you're aware of any, I'm all ears because I do not know any immune or any resistant vine, whether cultivated or wild or in germplasm repositories 
that shows any sign of either tolerance, resistance, or immunity to leaf roll or red blotch. But you know, th there, there are thousands of VD species out there that have never been screened and that we are not aware of. So I'm not saying there is none, but based on the work that has been done and my little experience, I'm not aware of any, unfortunately. That reemphasizes the critical importance of certification and the production of clean plants, because once a virus is in the vineyard, there is nothing one can do except pulling it out and or replacing the entire block. Okay, thank you very much everyone for your questions. And I love to see the collaboration in the chat section. So thank you also to the researchers that were answering some of those questions. I'm just gonna share my screen here for one last second while we wrap things up. So a special thanks goes to Sud, Pat and Mark for your presentations today. Uh, this was CGCN's first webinar. Of course, we had a few bumps in the road, but we're all learning here. Um, and just to make sure that we can post this to our website. So we will be posting this recording to CGCN's website. Anyone who registered with me will be getting a notification when this link is posted. So we'll post that there. And join us again on March 25th for our second webinar in this four part series. We will be presenting on the grapevine leaf roll virus. The March 25th date is just tentative. We haven't secured uh, a date yet. And that's why the time will also be announced. Um, in order to know when we have these dates, any future dates, if you want to know of any um, industry res resources, um, you can visit our website or you can visit our social media pages there, our Facebook page is CGCN RCCV and our Twitter page is CGCN underscore RCCV. So thank you again to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Sud, Pat, and Mark. Uh, and thank you to Ross for uh, in introducing everyone this morning or this afternoon. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great day. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. Well done. Great job, you guys. Good to see you. Stay thank safe, you. okay?